On today's Locked On Texan podcast, three leaps and vets in the streets. He's all hands on deck this season. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to a Thursday edition of the Locked On Texan Podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm John Hickman, joined by Cody Davis. Before we start today's show, Uvalde, Buffalo, uh, and and after Uvalde, I want to say I've read about maybe two more uh, attempted or mass shootings since Uvalde, which happened less than 48 hours ago. uh, Cody, I know I'm doing this and tell you about this, but for the people that has lost their lives uh, from Buffalo, which I'm still trying to recover from mentally, to your Valdi, watching those young babies, not even really ready for life, you know, still in the midst of adolescent and younger than that, just get their lives taken. There is no excuses. There isn't, there's nothing that we can say that should make up for the evil actions of the terrorists. I don't even want to call them people. These terrorists. And so I don't want to hear any excuses. I don't want to hear you guys make up reasons why this may have happened. It happened because they were evil in their heart. And for the families that has lost their young kids, their their, their great grandparents, their grandparents, the parents uh, in Buffalo and everywhere else, my heart goes to you guys. And again, um, it's hard kind of doing a show talking about sports right now when there's real things going in the world. But, you know, that's what we're here to do. And for today's show, we're going to talk about John Bernard. Year three should be a big leap for John Bernard. Now, before I get to John Bernard, I do want to remind you guys that the Houston Texans, what they did this offseason uh, surrounding that defensive line with players like Rasheem Wing from uh, – the Seattle Seahawks last season, who had six and a half sacks, Mario Addison, Jerry Hughes, Okawanko still kept Jordan Jenkins from last season. Uh, Derek Rivers is also a part of the Texans DN uh, group. Of course, they still have Malik Collins, Ross Blacklock, and Roy Lopez. So right now, when I look at that defensive front, guys, I look at a defensive front that is necessarily I don't foresee any of these guys getting market value in extended contracts. And I think that may be the underlying plan for Houston. But I want to look at John Grenard and why I believe this year three is very important, not only for him, but also for the success of the Houston Texans. Grenard has missed five games this past season with, a, with various injuries and being placed on the COVID, COVID list which caused him to miss a couple of games as well. Didn't finish in two other games this season. Only played and started in 12 games this year. Also missed three games his rookie year. That's eight games in two years that he's missed. That isn't a huge number, but it is a slight concern for me. What I like about Bernard is his lengthy arms and the way he uses them to keep opposing linemen from getting in his chest which helps him make that decision. Also, one thing about his game is that motor that he has. A lot of times when we're seeing him getting those sacks, the quarterback has to break out of the pocket, the pocket has collapsed, and then you're able to see Bernard use that motor to get after the quarterback and get his sack. At one point during the first half of last season, uh, John Bernard was leading the NFL with a sack for every 13.7 pass rushing snaps that he played. I definitely believe that he needs to get better, get a bread and butter move. Grenards does need help with establishing pure pass rushing moves consistently. Right now he is working uh, with Brandon Jordan and Malik Collins. He is a student of the game. We've heard about how much he dives into getting better playbook and just working on his craft of all of the edge rushers Houston has on their roster. Right now, Grenard 
is the only one which I don't think a huge differential in snaps played. I think he'll be the consistent starter throughout all 17 games if he's available. So that's also a plus. I first see him playing about 90 snaps, 90% of his snaps. When you look at who the Houston Texans brought in, Addison, uh, uh, Green, excuse me, Hughes, Jenkins from last season, Okawankwo, I think a lot of those guys are mainly going to be used in different spurts, especially Jordan Jenkins, especially Okawankwo, and even Jerry Hughes. I can see Rasheen Green and Mario Addison really share that opposite side in terms of snaps, but Jonathan Gennard will be the primary defensive end for Houston, and I think this is a big year for him. Houston definitely needs to make sure that across the board, the defensive line is improving, right, Cody? Like, I think everybody understands that. Uh, for Roy Lopez, we want to see him play more snaps consistently. Ross Blacklock build on year two. He's also another player for year three. We need to see an exponential amount of uh, a leap for him as well. But overall, for Renard, this, this is your year to separate your snap draft class that you <laughs> were in for the Houston. Everybody else on this roster in terms of producing the numbers would have definitely been a double-digit side guy last season if not for the five games missed. This year's important. Yeah, and I will 100% agree. In terms of third-year players, Jonathan Grenard is definitely – this This year is definitely a big year for, for Grenard. And, John, you know, ever since the draft, whether it was prior to the draft, during the draft, and, of course, our analysis after the draft, you know, my biggest thing was they did not go out and draft a defensive end. However, when I go back and I take a listen to what Nick Casario had to say, what Lovey Smith had to say about team building, I do believe that this is an organization that has a lot of faith and confidence in Gennard. And I 100% agree with them because what we have been able to see out of him in that a limited amount of time, he has had the opportunity to go out there on the field and showcase what he is able to do. We have seen a lot of promise out of John Gennard. However, John listeners and viewers, the number one thing he has to get better at, and I know this might sound a little bit funny, is just his health. Because, John, you said it perfectly, and this is something that we even talked about during the season, during our season recap in terms of every time we talked about John Gennard, if he is healthy, and of course during his rookie season he was a little bit more healthier, but, you know, Houston Texans, they bring their rookie on kind of slow. But even during his rookie season, if he had the appropriate amount of snaps second year if he's healthy and he's able to go out there on the field and showcase what he can do this is a guy that would definitely have double digit sacks however john going into his third year especially last year with all of the knickknack injuries that he's had i don't want to see grenard go through another season where he's battling knickknack injuries because if he does now you're looking at a standpoint of how do the Houston Texans revamp their defensive line and whether or not he's going to catch the label as an injury-prone player? I know there's some things he do have to clean up in his techniques. However, I think his techniques are good. He's already shown the ability to be a very reliable player on the defensive front. As a matter of fact, I think regardless of the system, Jonathan Gennard do has the talent to be any team's best defensive lineman. And by the way, Kudos to Lovey Smith from having him go from linebacker to defensive end. He's, what, one of maybe two players who actually excel in terms of the players who had to go who had to go through a position shift last year. But John Gennard, my only issue with this young man, he has to stay healthy. If he stays healthy, that defensive line is going to look better. Lovey Smith said himself, the defensive line is the engine of his defense. If he is healthy, that defensive line looking damn good. We already expecting an improved secondary. The Houston Texans defense is going to be damn good in 2022. But a lot is riding on Jonathan Grenard in terms of his health. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And last season, eight sacks, 19 pressures, only two missed tackles in 33 In 12 combined, games? In 12 games and in 33 combined uh, tackles with six hurries. Listen, but I also want to add this piece. What Houston is doing, I think, is very smart, especially considering they're trying to stay under a certain cap number. So they are signing guys 
that will not cost a lot or be a big hit towards the cap. We talk about Jerry Hughes being 33 years old, kind of past his prime and his, his great days. However, he, he is going to give you quarterback pressures. You look at Okra Wonko that played for the, <clears throat> excuse me, the L.A. Rams. He has the speed that if the pocket collapses, he can win and use that speed to throw the quarterback off his game. So for now with John Bernard, as Houston leading sack, uh, sack go-getter since J.J. Watt a couple of years ago, now what they're doing is, at least I believe my thought is, they're putting guys around you that in certain situations, they're going to do their job. That mantra, do your job, right? They're going <laughs> to do their job. And for Grenard, you go ahead and clean it up. So if you're on the field, I think everybody is expecting eight sacks to turn out to be between 12 to 13 sacks for next season, more pressures and more tackles as well. I think he could do it. But once again, he has to stay healthy. In order for him to do it, he has to be on the field. I love John Grenard. He's one of my favorite players on this team as of right now. Guys has a lot of talent. I'm just hoping for health. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we've been asking and built deliver. Built Bar granola bars are here. Built Bar never ceases amazement. They're coming out with all these different types of products and flavors and variety packs are dropping every single place. And they ain't missing, right? Like right now, they on a, a kind of one of them J. Cole runs where he's going platinum with no features. That's what we're seeing out of Built Bar. Built Bar granola, granola bars in three unbelievable flavors. You got the chocolate peanut butter brownie, chocolate coconut, and white chocolate berry. Want to try all free? You can get one of those mix box I was talking about at Built.com right now. These are so different from the bars you may be used to. Built granola bars are loaded with granola. It's a perfect combination of crunch and chewiness. But just like bars and the puff, like a protein and still covered in 100% real chocolate with 150 calories, 15 grams of protein, only, only four grams of sugar. Built granola bars will change your world. And how you look at granola bars, I'll start looking at them a little sexy now. <laughs> now, Built crack the code to better granola bars. They're the perfect healthy snack packed in your lunch. Take on the road or eat as a snack. Go to build.com. Use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. Welcome back, Locked On Texans listeners and viewers out there. Make sure you are subscribed to the Locked On Texan podcast wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube as well at Locked On Texans. Subscribe, like, and comment. I think it's very important that we look at the cornerback room and kind of discuss why the veterans are very important for this upcoming season. When Derek Stingley was drafted third overall, the excitement was there. That he's going to change the culture and the secondary and the cornerback room talk was there, rightfully so. We think he is that talented. However, even with Lovey Smith giving him a call and saying, we want you to follow and shadow the number one receiver on the opposing team, there's another receiver that needs to be covered. There may be another two receivers that need to be covered. There may be three receivers that another need to be covered, and Houston does have other cornerbacks on their roster. Houston retained Desmond King this offseason, along with Tavier Thomas. They also had an opportunity to snag uh, cornerback Steven Nelson away from the Philadelphia Eagles. He signed a $3 million, a $3 million contract with the Eagles last season, started – Opposite of Darius Slayton, Darius Slay, excuse me, appeared in 16 regular season games uh, last season with the Eagles, playing in that zone defense that the Eagles has been known to run, allowed 67% of his passes thrown his way, and a quarterback rating of 108.4 when thrown in his direction. He also turned 29 this offseason in January. And I think that's important. The age is something that we would normally look at and kind of shun. But with Derek Stingley being so young, he's only 21 years old, yeah, you look at Desmond King, you look at a top year Thomas who will be going into his fifth year. Desmond King has over five years experience in the NFL. Now Nelson, we look at Nelson. He has over five years of experience in the NFL. Started his career off with the Kansas City Chiefs. Had a phenomenal run 
with the Pittsburgh Steelers his first year there and played decently last season, one of the best tackling cornerbacks in the league. He is comfortable in that zone coverage, which is very important for Lovey Smith playing here, though in 2019 with the Pittsburgh Steelers only allowed eight passes for 107 yards and no TDs in man coverage. And so that may be a plus when you look at we're hearing Lovey Smith mention how they may change things up. They're not going to be uh, so, so-called, so quote-unquote, traditional Tampa 2 defense. So whenever you want to put Nelson out on the field to disguise, you know, well, maybe you can disguise that cover two and end up running a man off a man defense. So that's a plus. But overall, Cody, I would like to just say that for Houston, getting these vets, especially Desmond King, I think he'll be back to his natural nickel position. That's going to be important. Getting these vets around this rookie cornerback and a, a lot of these young guys on the defensive side of the ball because we cannot leave out Jalen Petrie, who I'm sure we'll see come down in the box and play a little bit of that slot corner whenever they want to mix things up. He's going to learn from Desmond King. That's important to this culture, this rebuild that Houston has been preaching. And not only preaching, but the, the offseason signings have added – and boost it to what they've been talking about. I'm glad we're talking about the cornerback group as of right now outside of Derek Stanley because I do know at some point, whether that be during training camp, um, during preseason, or as we prepare for week one of the 2022 regular season, we're going to have a discussion on who should be starting opposite of Derek Stingley. And I don't want to change the topic, but John, if I could just put my vote in as of right now, in terms of which cornerback is the second most important or the most important, of course, when you take Derrick Stingley out of the equation, I have to say that it's got to be Tavier Thomas because this was a guy last year who was arguably by far the Texans' best cornerback. He had put together the highest pro football focus grade amongst all Houston cornerbacks last year at 77.6. He only allowed a 61.9 completion percentage, and that was on 42 targets last year. And he also recorded the highest pass coverage grade, according to pro football focus, at 76.1. Tavier Thomas in his first season with the Houston Texans made some major improvements to his game and I'm expecting him to repeat that same performance or become even better this year. Why? Because, John, a player like Taviera Thomas' stature, who was able to thrive regardless of everything that was going on in that awful secondary, I think we can all agree in terms of them signing Nelson, in terms of them drafting Stingley, in terms of them drafting Jalen Petrie, this secondary group is going to be a hell of a lot better, which means there's a great possibility that we're going to see an even better version of Taviera Thomas. And look, I'm glad we're talking about Nelson. I'm glad we're talking about Thomas and even, even Desmond King because what we just finished talking about on yesterday, there is a small chance that Stingley might not be 100% come week one of the regular season. And he is going to be this team's number one cornerback. But if, but if there is a game or a couple of weeks to start the season off where, let's say, Lovey Smith has a change of plan and say, you know what, let's bring Stingley in slow, it's going to be Tavier Thomas covering the, the opposing team's number one cornerback. So, you know, I'm a big fan of Tavier Thomas. Love what he was able to do last year. But I am expecting this guy to have a big season next season. However, in terms of Nelson... The only way I would say Nelson can kind of eclipse Thomas is if we get the Nelson that was able to go out there and put on a great season in 2018 with the Kansas City Chiefs. And you're talking about a guy who had recorded four interceptions and five, 15 pass deflections. And you know how much Lovey Smith loved cornerbacks and defensive backs who can actually go out there and make plays on the ball. And Nelson do fit the criteria of what Lovey Smith loved to see. A defensive back who is also physical in terms of tackling and one who create takeaways and also made plays on the ball. Yeah, but I would also say in terms of Steven Nelson, the takeaways that he recorded his rookie season isn't overrated, but it is overrated to where we would look at him and his career-wise. His best year did come with the Pittsburgh Steelers where he only allowed 50% of the passes uh, thrown his way, only 491 yards uh, allowed that year. He only had one interception. I get it, 75 
uh, not 75, excuse me, but he had a total of his rookie year, the second year, a total of 65 tackles that year. And no, he barely had any missed tackles that year as well. Only six missed tackles, which was his second lowest of his career. His third lowest of his career was six overall. So Nelson, when he is good, the numbers will not be spectacular for turnovers, but that's why it's important to have this discussion because when Tavier Thomas was good last year, he had two interceptions. That isn't mind blowing. I mean, it's hard mm-hmm. to get more than it's hard to get interceptions in the NFL. Uh, you may get one and then get flagged for defensive penalties or something like that. So that happens. But the interception numbers isn't what make Nelson's Nelson good. What makes him good is completely taking away that opposing receiver. When the ball is in the air, any 50 50 balls. For Nelson, that's when we have seen the better version of him playing in the NFL. And so overall, the listing of who will be the next corner at the top of year, Thomas will be number two, CB2. After that, whenever Desmond King is needed, he'll be on the inside. There may be some times where they play him on the outside, whether that's due to injury or just schematically it makes sense against a certain receiver. But – I think that when they brought in Nelson, it was important for him, for that person, for for them to get the better version out of him, which is that Pittsburgh Steeler, where he's the number two, number three corner on the team. Thanks for making Locked On Texans your first listen today. Now make your second listen to Locked On NFL Podcast. Our national experts and insiders keep fans dialed in with the biggest stories and the latest news from around the league because an offseason doesn't equal a break in the action. Follow Locked On NFL every day on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this latest installment of Locked On Texans. And before we get out of here, I do want to talk about the first day of voluntary OTAs, keyword voluntary OTAs that took place on Tuesday um, John, the Houston Texans did have a really good turnout, as we mentioned on yesterday. Davis Mills was there. Brandon Cooks was there. Titus Howard was there. Um, just about any big-name player or <laughs> big-name player in terms of the Houston Texans that you can think of was there, except for Malik Collins and Laramie Tunsil. And I've heard so many people try to turn this into why Malik should be there and why Laramie Tunsil should be there. But look, why? Lovey Smith, Lovey Smith why? was not tripping. Lovey Smith said, where he from? Big Sandy, Texas? Voluntary means voluntary. And it's why? not that big of a deal. Um, He said, he did mention that 90 why? to 95 players on the Texans roster um, as of right now was in the in attendance and the players who were not in attendance had already spoken to Nick Casario, spoken to Lovey Smith, what? and had already told them ahead of time that they was not going to be there. I don't know why people making this out what? as a big deal. It may, maybe it would make just a little bit more sense if A, this was a team, let's say, in playoff championship contention, and B, once again, it's voluntary. You're talking about two guys in Laramie Tunsil and Malik Collins, who at the end of the season, especially at Larry Tunsil, you didn't know what the future had, had in store for them in the Houston Texans, but I've been told that those two guys are in great standings with this organization. It's voluntary, y'all. Come on now. The great Allen Iverson <laughs> once had a press conference and uh, practiced. Voluntary? We talking about voluntary? Come on, man. not the game, not the game that they go out there and what do you say? Blood, sweat, and tears. We talking about voluntary. Listen, man, these guys are grown <laughs> men. They may want to enjoy their off season. The thing about professional sports is when the season is over, you still may got still may have to nurse an injury. You still may have to do so many small things mm-hmm. to get ready. For the next season, that if this is voluntary, like kind of like charity work, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be, 
I want to spend time with my family. I want to spend time with my girlfriend. I want to spend time with my kids. I want to take a vacation. I want to go to different places. I want to get my mind clear before I actually have to show back up to work. I'm using my PTO days. Don't get mad at me because I put my PTO days in within the 90 day period that I had my opportunity to put them day in a, a, a approve me. And now I'm taking trips. It's crazy. That's ridiculous. Let's not be those people, Texan fans. We're better than that. At least I hope so. But voluntary? You talking about voluntary OTAs? Come on, man. I, I'm John Hickman. This is this is locked on Texan podcast. Ain't no grind like the slow grind. And this is why I say that because we're talking about folks getting mad that two <laughs> players weren't in OTAs. Make sure you are subscribing to the Locked On Texans on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter at Locked On Texans as well. Hey, you guys, if you're checking this out, if you are one of the 15, uh, 1.5 thousand plus followers and subscribers we have on YouTube, you see my name down there? I lost my old Twitter page. I need for y'all to run them numbers back up for me. John underscore Hickman 12. And as always, I'm your host, Cody Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, that's Cody, C-O-T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.